Restore to us that feeling, Lord, that we couldn't wait. We couldn't wait to hear from you again where there was nothing else more exciting happening. I don't know about you, but when I, I remember meeting Stephen and I'm like, is it too soon to talk again? This is crazy, this is weird. And I think anyone, anyone who has been touched by Jesus knows exactly what I'm talking about. Because he ruins you for any other. And when we lose first love, when we remove our eyes, when we look away, Everything else is disappointing. Everything else is less than, and we wonder why life has not gone the way we hoped it would. We wonder why things aren't going the way we hoped they would. We wonder why the thing that God promised us is not happening in our lives. And we wonder, oh, I, th I thought you called me to this thing. But the, the caller is the keeper. The caller is the keeper. And the minute that we become more excited about what we want him to do through us instead of what he means to us, the lamp has gone dim. The light is going out. And we talk a lot about going to the altar, right? We're going to marry, we're going to marry him. We talk about going to the altar. And then we leave the altar and we wonder why things fall apart. The key was to never leave the altar. Do you know the first time the word for worship is used? Is in Genesis 22, when God asks Abraham for Isaac. What was the only thing more precious than his own life? His son. And Abraham, Abraham, who trusted God, climbed up that mountain and raised that knife. And the voice of the Lord said, don't you lay a hand on him. Because now I know that there's nothing you withhold. This is worship, to stay on the altar to stay in covenant. It's the only way to keep a covenant. We can't keep that covenant without him. Do you know that you can bless God, but you can't impress God? He gave you everything. If every one of your gifts. He's not looking for your giftedness. He gave those anyways. He is unimpressed. He knows he's awesome. He's looking for your givenness. Why do we think he never picked anyone the world would ever pick? Why do we think he told the shepherds first? <laughs> I'll never forget being a little girl my parents would be in ministry and I remember the first time y'all called me up on stage to sing with you and I like ran out of the room crying. I was terrified, <laughs> terrified. And I think about how awesome God is now. I had no idea. I had no idea what he would do. And I certainly couldn't have done it. But the caller is the keeper. And all he's looking for is for you to look for him. All he wants is everything. He may not always draw you that way. Because contrary to popular theology, he does remove his hand. I don't know if you're reading this. There is a people he falls on. 
It matters who carries the ark. And it matters how they carry it. It matters. And he may save you, but there is much more to be trusted with. He wants to be closer. He doesn't just want you to make it in. He's looking for lovers who pay attention to the whispers, who are willing to sit in the discomfort of silence, even in corporate settings. Typically when we get quiet, somebody feels like they need to fill it. But as our dear friend Michael says, the further in you go, the less you take with you. There's no room for all of these things in our hands. And there is a place in love. Where you, can't, you quit thinking about all the things that you feel like he's called you to do. And he becomes the dream. All those other things can be done without him and it's heartbreaking because it happens all the time. And we can get used to thinking that the evidence of his hand on our lives is stadiums, that the evidence of hands, his hand on our lives is a room full of people singing songs we've written. It's not. Because he said, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, but not enter in. He said, many will cast out demons in my name. They'll have a measure of power. They'll walk in things. And if you do not know the spirit of God, you will do not discern the spirit. And we will find ourselves, when we climb off the altar, we will find ourselves exchanging the anointing for opportunity. our songs and our sermons become palatable for the culture around us. We begin to custom our own Christianity in the name of Jesus. And we can blow up a room with our hype. We can blow up a room and move a room because it's good, but it's void of his presence. The beautiful thing about God, one of the endlessly beautiful things, is that, as my, my dear friend Elizabeth said, Jesus is more humble than we are. <sighs> and he'll come to meet with people in spite of us. And we can often think that when he comes into a room while we're doing whatever it is we're doing, that it was because we were here. That's when first love's lamp has gone out. The minute we think we had anything to do with it. <laughs> when the hungry come, they will be fed because he's good. And to the pure, all things are pure. It's why the presence of God moves in rooms where even people who have no character are leading worship. That's not a judgment, it's just true. Because God won't withhold from someone who comes in with a pure heart to see God. They will see God. <laughs> the Beatitudes are mind boggling. <clears throat> He's so kind, but he wants to do it with us and he wants to do it through us. 
and he's looking for a bride that won't look away. that won't be moved by the crowd. Because what happens in private will eventually play out in public. It is inevitable. It's impossible for it not to happen. And the fruit will always speak of the root. You can see people in moments. This is like the 5% of your whole life. This. 5%. The rest of your life is lived elsewhere in smaller groups of people. You want to know who I really am? This is all real, thankfully. I can tell you that's true. But you ask the people who are in my house every day. about the fruit and that's who'll tell the truth about you how does Jesus experience you in that Matthew 6 place but when you pray go into your room shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you openly but the reward is not all the stuff. That's bonus. That's amazing. But the reward is his presence, his glory. What we do when he comes to us and pours out measures of anointing on us because not everyone has the same I know we love to think about things like we're all the same and we all can it's not true guys I don't know if you ever noticed that it's not true and we can either get next to people who carry something we don't and we can go oh god I need you more See, comparison is only your enemy when you get off the altar. Because when you're on the altar and you get next to someone who is bigger than you, who has gone further into the presence of Jesus than you, it ought to make you want him more. When you're on the altar, it pushes you towards Jesus. When you're off the altar, you look at all you don't have, or you look at, you, you start comparing yourself to the people like, well, I could do that. And you walk into worship services and then begin to break it down, like oh, what you think they should be doing and what they're not doing and, and what's good and what's not. As if we determined that. The whole time, we're, we're like observing the room, taking it in to see what we think about it. This is when we've come off the altar. Instead of coming in and engaging with him, no matter what anyone is doing. I've seen entire rooms shift because one person has buried themselves in worship under a chair somewhere. And they came in with oil. They didn't come to get it. They came with it. And this gathering should teach us and fill us in some ways, but it is not our sustenance. Imagine what would happen in a room like this if we all came in with our lamps full. Because I love you, but I can't give you my lamp. I can't give you my history with God. I can't. I can't. You, you have your very own testimony, and you get, you, you'll go to your very own altar. And he'll talk to you in a way he doesn't speak to me. This will never change, but he'll have something with you that he won't have with anyone else. 
And if you're busy looking at what someone else has, thinking, oh, I don't have enough, or they should see what I have, we'll always miss him. We miss him. The arrogance of that is like a foul stench in his nostrils. Pride is what caused Lucifer to fall. I heard a pastor say one time that except for pride, every demon could be in worship around the throne. Oh my God. You know why I think he said that? Because you can deal with all these other things. But until we bring all of ourselves, there's nothing we can do about it. Fear is one of the most tolerated sins in the church. Fear of not being enough, fear of someone else having more than you did. Jesus gave more to them than he gave to me. The talents, guys, the parable of the talents. He is looking for what you'll do with the anointing he gave to you. When we climb off the altar, when we leave the altar of intimacy, the oil of intimacy runs dry. I didn't plan on this. I hope that you're with me. I just feel the, I feel the Lord so sweetly in this room. He, he wants our idols. He wants our other loves. And he doesn't just want the things that are obviously bad. He wants it all. He wants your calling back. He wants to become your biggest dream. He is the water and the well. I'm going to say that again. He is the water and the well from which we draw it. There is no other place to get living water. <laughs> he is the hunger and he is the food. We can't even be hungry unless he helps us. Right? But he's so kind. Because it's like with physical food. You may not have an appetite yet for what you should be eating. But if you start somewhere, you eat your first salad. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> it might not sound good at first, but you train your palate, right? It takes a mature palate to know a fine wine. Don't be offended with me. The Bible talks about this, right? Isn't that true? If you don't train your palate, if you don't train your appetite, if I don't teach my spirit, my soul, what to crave. I might be eating donuts all my life. I've never had eggs for breakfast. I didn't know what they could do for me until I started eating better. And I realized, oh, this is nutrients. I can go a whole day off of this. I'm alive. I'm not crashing halfway through the day because I filled myself up on sugar and then wondered what happened. Because all it takes is one real taste to one another one of a real Jesus, real Jesus. I believe, I believe when we take communion that it is his body and it is his blood. I know that freaks some people out, but he didn't say, here's some bread. This represents my body. We like to say that in church, but that's not what Jesus said. He said, this is my body. This is my blood. It was the last meal he shared with him before he gave himself to the cross. 
And remember after he'd risen on the road to Emmaus. Remember. And he begins talking to the disciples. And they're like freaking out. Because they're like, oh, their hearts are burning. But they can't see him. And he starts to walk off. And they're like, no, stay with us, stay with us. Stay with us. And they don't see him. They don't even realize it's Jesus until what? Until he breaks the bread and gives it to them. We have to train our appetite. Hunger can be habitual. Okay, it can be like, it's a habit thing. It has to become a lifestyle. If we don't take the cup he's poured for us and eat the bread he broke for us, then there's no life in us. There's no part with him. It has to be the whole Christ or it is nothing at all. He's everything or he's nothing. There is not another option. You're like, Steph, that's really extreme. I'm pretty sure Judgment Day will also be. I'm not trying to scare anyone. There are so many things that I said no to in religion that now I say no to for love. It's different. I'm, when I talk about the judgment, when I read this word, I know some people who, so many people who, so many people in the church who are terrified of the whole Bible and they don't talk about it all and they can't read it all because it's like scary God to them. Because they have not eaten, ingested the whole Christ. They're not taking him at his whole word. You cannot have a holistic revelation of him without the whole of his word. Now we see in part, then we'll fully know. Now we see as a glass, in a, in a glass dimly. This is, this is all in part. The only way we can continue fully knowing him, and we will for all eternity, by the way, there's no end to him. There's no like arriving at this place. <laughs> oh my God. There's a reason why covenants like marriage are uncomfortable. There's a reason why it's costly to make covenant. Because you can't have a resurrection without a death. I've always read 1 Corinthians 13, the, the excellence of love. I've, I mean, I was a pastor's daughter, so this is a staple, all right? If you don't, if you don't have that memorized in your pastor's daughter, <laughs> So anyways, no, I, I, I've read it my whole life, and it's true this way as well, but I've read it my whole life, um, reading about love, like between one another, right? If we don't love each other with God's love, if we don't love this way with his love, being filled with his love, then, it's, then we have nothing. But this year, I was... <laughs> up in the night waiting for my little guy to come. Very pregnant. If you've been pregnant before, you know that the hormones wake you up in the night and it's like the Lord's getting you ready to be up with that little one, right? He's, he thinks of everything. But I was up in the night, it was probably like 3 a.m. and I, but when I could go back to sleep, I felt that, that nudge on my heart before I closed the door. And I'm like, Lord, give me grace. I'm, I want to be with you. Keep me awake. I'm tired. I know you know. And I sat down. And he said, I said, what do you want to talk about? Tell me anything. Don't wait for morning. Don't wait for daylight. Tell me now. Speak to me. I'm listening. 
And he took me to this very well-known passage of scripture and he began to read it to me, but in the perspective of first love for him. Now that, y'all might have been doing that a long time, but your girl had not. I, I, I started reading this like my mind was exploding and my heart was exploding and I thought I was gonna come out of my skin because I, had, I hadn't read it in this context before. His words alive. You can read the same thing for your whole life and get something new out of it every time because he's, it's living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. It divides. Ha! And I want to read it to you and I want, I want you to close your eyes for a minute. I, w- I want you to ask the Lord to bring you back to the altar of first love. I, I just, <sighs> he's longing for you, he's longing to be with you in the watches of the night, in the early morning hours, in the in-betweens when you're in your car, in the, in the crowded rooms and crowded shopping areas, where, wherever it is. He's, he's in the middle of your baby screaming and, and needing you. He is looking for your affection. He knows that if you'll look to him, you'll have everything you need. If we can see him, we'll get through anything. So we climb up on the altar again and we ask that you would restore first love to us and that as we read these words to close tonight your word would come alive to us in a new way and it would stir our hearts again to burn like wildfire impossible to quench if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but I do not have love. I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I don't have love, that first love for Jesus, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but I don't have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. That means love doesn't get tired of waiting for him. Waiting on him. Love is not jealous. It doesn't brag and it's not arrogant. love does not act unbecomingly. It doesn't seek its own gain. It is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. When he's first love, you can take the truth. You long for it. Love bears all things. Your children could be martyrs. Love bears all things. We could be raising children that give their lives for the gospel. but love bears all things. (laughs) 
Love endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. It doesn't matter how amazingly gifted you are. It doesn't matter how accurate your prophecy is. It doesn't matter how profound your tongues, how quickly you can roll it off out of your mouth, how fast it goes. It doesn't matter. It'll all be still. It'll all be quiet. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. And when I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face with our first love. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. Now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these in love. Mm, you're still my first love. You're still You are. 